Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to continue talking about cranial nerve 10, or the vagus nerve, and we're going to focus on the branches of the vagus nerve and its functions within the thoracic cavity. And in the next video, we'll focus more on the abdominal and the pelvic cavities. Before we go into all this detail right here, let's go back and do a brief review of the origin of the vagus nerve. So just so you're aware, right here, this is cranial nerve 10, or vagus nerve. And recall that the vagus nerve originates from the most inferior part of the brainstem, which is the medulla oblongata. You can see its origin right here coming off of that. And we follow it, and it loops over, and it's going to move out of the cranium through the jugular foramen. So this little dotted circle right here is meant to illustrate the jugular foramen. It's going to exit that, and then it's going to come out of the cranium, basically into the neck and then the thoracic cavity. That's what we're going to pick up with right now. So we're now looking at the same picture from a minute ago, but we're zoomed in. So this circle right here, this is our jugular foramen. Okay? And this nerve right here, the one in the middle that's thicker, this one is the vagus nerve. So we follow the vagus nerve from the cranium. It exits the cranial cavity through that jugular foramen. And then pretty much right after it exits the jugular foramen, we get this enlargement right here, which is called the superior ganglion. You'll notice that the superior ganglion also immediately gives off a branch called the meningeal branch. So it gives it off and then that meningeal branch immediately goes right back up into the jugular foramen like it didn't want to leave. Okay, And it goes back up here and it provides sensory information or innervation uh, for the dura mater of the posterior cranial fossa. The superior ganglion also gives off another branch here. This is the auricular branch, auricular meaning the ear. It's also called Alderman's nerve, named after the guy who discovered this. And the auricular branch here provides sensory innervation to the skin of the ear canal, the tragus, which is approximately right here, you can look that up, and then also the auricle of the ear. So that's a sensory branch. And those are the main two branches of the superior ganglion. Then we descend further from the superior ganglion and we reach another enlargement. This enlargement's even larger than the superior one. This is the inferior ganglion. Now going inferior from that, there's quite a few very important branches, but before we go to those, notice that the accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11, actually has some communication uh, with this inferior ganglion. We won't go into that much right now, but remember that that accessory nerve after it comes back up through the foramen magnum, it loops around, exits the jugular foramen with cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. And so one of these branches here of that accessory nerve has some communication with that inferior ganglion and therefore the vagus nerve, okay? Now, as we mentioned, this inferior ganglion gives off several branches as we go down. The first one to discuss is the pharyngeal branch. Now the pharyngeal branch, is going to be motor. It innervates muscles within the pharynx. So for example, the pharyngeal constrictors. One exception to that is the stylopharyngeus. And this is innervated by cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. Remember there are three pharyngeal constrictors. There's the superior, the middle, and the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. And really the pharyngeal branch sort of forms at its end near the middle uh, constrictor, it forms a pharyngeal plexus, and that plexus sort of branches out to innervate all three of those pharyngeal constrictors. And the purpose of those muscles is to help with swallowing. Obviously, you also have to have the esophagus, but in order to get the bolus of food after you've chewed it from the mouth to the esophagus, you obviously have to go through the pharynx, and those constrictors aid in that. The other muscles that the pharyngeal branch provides innervation for are the soft palate muscles. And the main exception to that is the tensor villi palatini, which is innervated by nerve 2 tensor villi palatini, which is actually innervated by a very small branch of the trigeminal nerve, specifically that mandibular nerve V3. The next branch we're going to talk about is the sinus nerve or the sinus branch, which you can see here descending from the inferior ganglion. And it's going towards these structures near the heart like the bifurcation of the carotid artery. We'll get to that in just a minute. Now, if you look up the sinus nerve on Google, 
What you'll probably find is that most sources will actually implicate this with the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9. But it turns out that when it comes to the carotid bodies and the carotid sinus and the aortic arch, there's a lot of shared innervation between the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve. And it turns out that it's actually more glossopharyngeal nerve, but the vagus nerve does contribute. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Now what you see right here is the common carotid artery, and as it goes up, it bifurcates into the larger internal carotid artery right here, and the smaller external carotid artery. External one goes outside the cranium, internal carotid artery goes within the cranium to supply the brain. So it's the major blood supply to most of the cerebrum. Also the way you know the difference here other than the size is there's a slight engorgement of the internal carotid artery right after the bifurcation, and that's really where the carotid sinus is. So what's the significance here? Well, the carotid sinus contains a lot of baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are actually mechanoreceptors that respond to stretch of the blood vessel. And so whenever there's minimal stretch, that indicates that the blood pressure is low, maybe too low. And so it initiates a baroreceptor reflex by sending this afferent information back up to the medulla that we've got low blood pressure, and the brain will then help to uh, bring the blood pressure back up by activating the sympathetic nervous system. Also, if there's too much stretch of these blood vessels right here, the walls, those mechanoreceptors say, hey, look, we've got too high a blood pressure, and so they'll also relay that information. And in that case, the parasympathetic nervous system will activate to help bring the blood pressure down. And so the carotid sinus is going to be the main site of those baroreceptors. Now, if we look right on top of the bifurcation, right there where my mouse is, that's where the carotid bodies would be. And the carotid bodies actually contain chemoreceptors. So the chemoreceptors monitor things like blood pH. And so obviously, we want to maintain a narrow window for pH of the blood between about 7.35 and 7.45. And so those chemoreceptors monitor things like hydrogen ion concentration. And so if the pH were to drop too much and become too acidic, well, again, those chemoreceptors are going to relay that information uh, ultimately to the medulla, and changes will be made to attempt to help bring the pH back up to normal levels. And the reverse situation is also true. And in general, the carotid sinus is for the baroreceptors, and the carotid body, which would be right about there at the top of the bifurcation, that would actually be the chemoreceptors. There's also structures in the arch of the aorta. And the arch of the aorta, which is not shown here, but it would be down here somewhere, uh, the arch of the aorta actually contains both baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. And the chemoreceptors, just like they're contained in the carotid body, are also contained in structures in the aorta called aortic bodies. Okay? In general, all of those structures are innervated by some branches of this sinus nerve. Okay? And remember, it's both glossopharyngeal and vagus, and technically it's less of vagus and more of glossopharyngeal, but the vagus nerve does contribute. And so those afferents from the carotid structures and the aortic arch are relayed back to this inferior ganglion, back up to the superior ganglion here, and then ultimately to the medulla. The next one to discuss from the inferior ganglion is the superior laryngeal nerve. Now the superior laryngeal nerve is a mixed nerve and it itself really doesn't do anything other than divide into an internal laryngeal nerve which is the sensory part and an external laryngeal nerve which is the motor part. Let's first talk about the sensory part, the internal laryngeal nerve. So the internal laryngeal nerve is sensory, and it provides sensory innervation for structures above the vocal cords. Uh, you can read about those here. It's going to be the mucosa of the pharynx, laryngeal vestibules, epiglottis, voleculae. But really, we're talking about above the vocal cords. So it's really only getting a very small amount of the laryngeal area. Okay? It's technically defined as a sensory nerve, but it does have some secretomotor function uh, because if we're talking about the mucosa here um, in all of these structures, the mucosa have glands that are, of course, going to have to release mucus to line the walls of the lumen. And so uh, the internal laryngeal nerve also provides that innervation. But for the most part, this nerve is going to be sensory. Jumping ahead just to kind of fill in some gaps, We'll cover this one in a little bit. The recurrent laryngeal nerve has some sensory function, and it provides sensory innervation below the vocal cords. So this one is going to be below the vocal cords, and then this internal laryngeal nerve is above the vocal cords. 
So that was one part of this superior laryngeal nerve. But the other branch going a little bit further down is the external laryngeal nerve. This one is motor, and it innervates the following muscles. We have the cricothyroid muscle. This is the main one that it innervates. But it also has some function in innervating the superior pharyngeal muscles, like the superior constrictor. Now, we already mentioned that this pharyngeal branch up here uh, forms that pharyngeal plexus, which sort of gets all three of the pharyngeal constrictors. However, with this external one, there is some communication with that plexus. And so for that reason, the external laryngeal nerve is going to have some control of the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Okay, But the main one that we're thinking of with this nerve is the cricothyroid muscle. All right, so going back up to this inferior ganglion right here, we talked about the pharyngeal branch, the sinus nerve or sinus branch, superior laryngeal nerve and its two branches. And then this thicker one coming down from the inferior ganglion, this is really just a continuation of the vagus nerve. This is still vagus nerve. It goes down pretty far. And you can see here that it's going to go right over the subclavian artery. Now, I will go ahead and tell you that this is the right vagus nerve. And there's a reason that I know that that we'll go over in just a minute. But it turns out that the right vagus nerve is going to cross over the subclavian artery. But as it does, it gives off another branch. This branch is going to be the recurrent laryngeal nerve. When you see the term recurrent, it usually means that a branch is given off distally and then it kind of loops around and comes back to a particular structure, in this case the laryngeal area. So after passing over the subclavian artery, the recurrent laryngeal nerve branches off and then goes behind really where the subclavian artery comes off of uh, this brachiocephalic artery right here. And then it continues on up here really between the trachea and the esophagus and it goes back up to the laryngeal area. I already mentioned it has a sensory function, and that is providing sensory innervation below the vocal cords. Remember that the internal laryngeal nerve, which came from this uh, superior laryngeal nerve, this provided sensory information above the vocal cords. Well, recurrent laryngeal nerve is below. All right. Now, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a mixed nerve because it has both sensory and motor function. And so the motor function pretty much gets every other muscle here in the larynx that wasn't already innervated. Remember that the external laryngeal nerve innervates the cricothyroid muscle, so pretty much everything else is innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerves. Most of these muscles you probably haven't heard of, they're not common to talk about in most uh, applications, but they are posterior cricoarytenoid, lateral cricoarytenoid, arytenoid, thyroarytenoid, areopiglottis. Also note that the recurrent laryngeal nerve gives branches that go to the deep cardiac plexus for the heart, to the trachea, to the esophagus, and also to the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Okay? Now, coming back over here, how did I know that this was the right vagus nerve? Well, when I see the recurrent laryngeal nerve branching off, it turns out that the right recurrent laryngeal nerve branches off at a different point than the left one. And to understand that, let's zoom back out and look at this picture over here on the right. So in this picture over here, I see the uh, larynx. This is the thyroid cartilage specifically. Coming below that, the trachea with these tracheal cartilages. Down here would be where the left ventricle would eject into the aorta. So we have the arch of the aorta. Here's the ascending component. And then this is really the arch over here. And then the descending would be over here on the right side of the picture. Now remember, the arch of the aorta gives off three branches. The first one is this one, which is not really shown very big, but it would be the brachiocephalic artery. The second one is this left common carotid, and the last one is the left subclavian artery. And then remember that this first branch, the brachiocephalic artery, uh, quickly divides into the right common carotid and the right subclavian artery. Now when we look at this right vagus nerve coming down, remember that it passes in front of the right subclavian artery, and then it gives off this recurrent laryngeal nerve, which goes kind of underneath the right subclavian artery, sort of behind the brachiocephalic artery, and then loops back up to go to the larynx. But if we look at the left vagus nerve as it goes down, it goes in front of the left subclavian artery, but then it goes down a little bit further before it branches. And then it gives off that left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which loops 
underneath the arch of the aorta and then comes back up towards the larynx. So in other words, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve branches off more distally or more inferiorly than the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. The other implication of this is in an aortic aneurysm. Now, we're not talking about a triple A. That's an abdominal aortic aneurysm. That's way down in the abdominal cavity, uh, near where the abdominal aorta bifurcates into the common iliac arteries. For just a normal aortic aneurysm, normally we're referring to the arch of the aorta. And it's normally right around here uh, where the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery branch off. So when you have an aneurysm, there's a weakening of the walls of the vessel. And so the vessel kind of balloons out. So instead of being like this diameter, it would be like this diameter. It would get much wider, almost like you're blowing up a balloon. And so if the aorta balloons out right here, it's going to put a lot of tension on the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which loops under it. And so you're going to see impairments that are consistent with damage to the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. However, generally, the right recurrent laryngeal nerve will be spared because it does not pass underneath the arch of the aorta. Hopefully that makes sense. Now when we're looking at this vagus nerve, we're coming down here, we see that it gives off this recurrent laryngeal nerve, but then there's still a component of the vagus nerve that keeps going down. Let's now follow it further. So all this over here we're going to ignore because this is actually the next video. And let's actually zoom in a little bit right here. So this is kind of where we were. This is the inferior, also called the nodose ganglion. We have the vagus nerve that continues down here. You'll notice also right here is where it gives off that recurrent laryngeal nerve. Okay, um, I didn't mention this before, but you'll notice there's another branch that actually comes off before that. It wasn't shown in the picture before. This is the superior cervical cardiac branch. Notice that it comes off before that recurrent laryngeal nerve. And based on its name, it's going to go to the heart, as you see right there. You'll also notice that the recurrent laryngeal nerve also itself has another branch that comes off pretty quick, and that is the thoracic cardiac branch, which also is going toward the heart. Remember I mentioned a minute ago that the recurrent laryngeal nerve also has branches that go to the deep cardiac plexus. Those are the branches that go to the deep cardiac plexus right here. Now, after that recurrent laryngeal nerve comes off, the vagus nerve still continues down, right? And it gives off more branches to the lungs. These are the bronchial branches. You could imagine that the left vagus nerve supplies the left lung, the right vagus nerve supplies the right lung, okay? And the vagus nerve is going to continue down. Now, we'll talk about this more in the next video, but obviously the vagus nerve is going to have to move from the thoracic cavity into the abdominal cavity, and you have the big diaphragm that blocks that. So how does the vagus nerve actually get into the abdominal cavity? Well, in the diaphragm, there's a hole called the esophageal hiatus, which allows the esophagus to pass through the diaphragm. Because obviously the esophagus is going to have to pass through the diaphragm because then it basically merges with the stomach, right? Well, the vagus nerves actually go through that esophageal hiatus, okay? And at some point, those vagus nerves are more or less going to change names. So as this one continues down, it's going to become the posterior vagal trunk. This one over here has been cut off from the top, but this one is the anterior vagal trunk. So how do those correspond to the left and right vagus nerves? Well, the basic idea is something we're going to talk about more in the next video, and that's that the anterior vagal trunk is mostly the left vagus nerve. It has contributions from the right, but it's mostly left. And then the posterior vagal trunk, which is this one over here, is going to be mostly the right vagus nerve, but it does have some contributions uh, from the left vagus nerve. Okay, That's not super important right now. The very last thing I wanted to go over here is some of the effects that the vagus nerve might have on some of these organs, like the heart and the lungs. We know that the vagus nerve is the major contributor to the parasympathetic nervous system. So what would be the parasympathetic nervous system's effect on the lungs? Well, in terms of the bronchioles, it would be bronchoconstriction. Remember, it's a sympathetic response that causes bronchodilation because if you're in a sympathetic fight-or-flight response, 
you're theoretically going to be running from danger, right? You need your airways open as much as possible, so that gives you that bronchodilation. But for parasympathetic effects, now the lungs are going to bronchoconstrict. And that's again under the influence of these bronchial branches from the vagus nerve. In terms of the heart, during a parasympathetic response, or just rest and digest, right, the heart rate's going to be low. And in order to do that, the vagus nerve is going to have to have some influence on the pacemakers of the heart, right? The pacemakers of the heart are the SA node, and in some cases the AV node, but for most people it's the SA node. Well, it turns out that the vagus nerves, right and left, are each going to have control of one of those nodes. It's actually mainly the right vagus nerve that controls the SA node, and it's the left vagus nerve that controls the AV node. Okay? And the way that they do this is by their neurons releasing acetylcholine, which binds to receptors on the cells of those nodes. And that causes, therefore, the depolarization rate to decrease, and then we get a lower heart rate. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how the vagus nerve functions in the thoracic cavity. In the next video, we'll pick up with how it actually functions in the abdominal cavity. See you then. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.